Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's parent webinar. Um, this webinar is on getting to grip, getting to grips with your child's neurodivergent diagnosis, and we are delighted to have you join us this evening. The session is uh, designed to provide valuable insights and practical advice on navigating the complexities of a neurodivergent diagnosis. Whether you are new to this journey or have been on it for some time, our goal is to support you in understanding your child's unique needs and empowering you to advocate effectively. So, so um, our webinar will cover various aspects, including emotional responses, practical steps and strategies to support both you and your child. And we have prepared a series of questions that we will discuss offering a structured approach to this important topic. As we progress through the session, uh, we encourage you to uh, actively participate by using the Q&A feature. So in feature, if you have any questions and comments, please type them into the Q&A section and we will address them during the designated Q&A period at the end of this webinar. Uh, we will even answer them as we go along. So this will ensure that everyone has an opportunity to contribute and learn from each other's experiences. We hope that this webinar will provide you with new perspectives and practical tools to support your child and family better. So thank you for joining us and let's begin our discussion. I just need to wait for Sam to come online so that we can uh, quickly start this. So Sam Rotaro is also the mother of a new Good to have you here, Sam. <laughs> so, Sam, let's start off with you. You're also the mother of two neurodivergent children. Uh, oh. Can you share with us your initial reaction when you first received your child's neurodivergent diagnosis? I mean, you are an educational psychologist. You know all about these things, and then you get this diagnosis. Yes, it's very daunting um, because, unfortunately, when you know more, you... Um, you don't want to know, hear these things. You don't want to to accept it. It's really, really difficult to get it. And um, also we the delay in, you know, you see it, but oh, no, maybe I'm just seeing it because I work with it every day. So, so then you're delayed in facing it. So it is very daunting, but the, um, the freedom and the acceptance once you do accept it and you start walking the journey and start enjoying the, the fruits and the strengths. Um, of your children. That makes it special. Um, I also have a neurodivergent child. Mm -hmm. and for me, it was very difficult because building up to the diagnosis was quite uh, interesting because we had all these meltdowns in the classroom and all these complaints of the teachers on a daily basis. And you did not know. I mean, I'm also trying to know. And we did not know what it was. And initially, we mm -hmm. could not even find the diagnosis that were applicable. So it was a long journey to get to something that was, a, was, was kind of what they could say it is and that journey was exhausting for me it was so difficult not to work with the diagnosis so when we got the diagnosis at the end uh, which is now the beginning of a long journey after that it was really amazing because now i could give it a name and i mm. think for me that was a relief to say oh this is what it is and now we can start managing it and I can tell teachers what it is you know that kind of thing it just it was for me that was a great experience to have the diagnosis it was not threatening I was relieved <laughs> to have the diagnosis <laughs> yes mm. and to to be able to um just confirm what you're seeing but you don't quite want to see and then have someone confirm it for you so, it was also a very nice feeling so what were the early steps you took to educate yourself, um, especially about the specific neurodivergent neurodiv condition as well? Because the, there's so much information, but how did you go around to, to get that information? You know, what was interesting was it was more difficult for me to share the information with others. So when I received the, the um, diagnosis and it was confirmed, then to go back and explain it to my spouse was one of the most difficult things because I suddenly didn't have the words for it. Mm -hmm. It's one thing being able to describe it and deal with a client mm -hmm. that's going through it and, and empathize, but it's quite another when you have to deal with it yourself mm -hmm. and then communicate mm -hmm. about it to a spouse and to family members for them to understand why you cannot go to a restaurant without a wall <laughs> because your child will just run never stop running so um yeah it makes life difficult but that was yeah. difficulty for me i think the, the the difficult thing about educating yourself is the 
the overload of resources that are available at the moment and you don't know who to believe what so if your child's got adhd and the one end you read something that tells you your child will be a drug addict if they take the medication and the other hand will say oh this child's got gifts that will take them far in life so you get all this conflicting um information mm -hmm. if you start going i mean it, google is not your friend in that <laughs> at that point in time no not at all it makes it extremely difficult to know where to go and what to read and um i must say colleagues helped a lot and speaking to teachers and just getting a group together that I trusted, speaking to the OTs, speaking to the speech therapists, speaking to the doctors, and just gathering real information. Going onto Google, like you said, scary sto stories, not only about the medication, but about the future prediction of, of what's going to, you know, what life's going to look like for your child. And that was also very, very scary. So, yeah, I think for me, the getting the information to empower yourself, to understand it from a different perspective, from an, from being the parent in the situation. It's talking to people that work with it every day, listening to people like myself, sharing the information in a, um, a what's the word, when you don't have it, you don't have to deal with it yourself, from an objective point of view, that helps a lot, yeah. I also think it's, it's good to talk about it, I mean, mm -hmm. Do not go quiet on it. Talk to your spouse. Talk to everyone and, and, and find out what you can find out and talk to other parents who actually go through it as well. Join support groups. Um, mm -hmm. So what resources or professionals were most helpful to you understanding your child's diagnosis? Um, funny enough, the occupational therapist for us was a huge help at that time. Um, we were working with a sensory integration occupational therapist and... I think the practicals, the practical way that she could show me um, how to manage and also how to create a scenario to work through it um, in the right way helped a lot. So for me, and everybody's different, some people prefer to learn from their doctor, other people prefer to learn from the psychologist, and for us it was the occupational therapist. And I think as long as you are working with someone that sees your child, your child, because remember this is a very individual diagnosis. No neurodiverse child is the same. And so working and listening and working and learning from somebody that sees your particular child, I think makes a huge difference in this. For me, I think it was the psychiatrist that actually mm -hmm. uh, list, literally went into it and said, we need to get a diagnosis now. And, um, mm -hmm. and then she really educated me on what we should do and 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 also what i really um but really helped a lot was when she explained the medication in detail to me and mm. i i could ask her all the questions i would like to ask and i thought and i decided that i'm going to trust her with it i'm not going to yeah. verify it with others at all. i'm going to trust her with it because you need to start trusting someone when you go this route mm. and giving your child medication i think is for any parent it, it's a daunting task you do not want to do it but you you know that they need it and and they and then she explained to me that um all the you know all the research in in that field and and the outcomes if they take medication if they're not taking medication so mm. and if you have a child that's really on the extreme side of adhd was really a tornado then you know it's better for them so um although you have your reservations about medication it's better for them and when you see it's working then you know then it's 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 really a relief to 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 everyone but it in is. Case, yeah and so my next question is something that i had a quite an interesting experience with so we gave my child medication for quite a while and he just took the medication and without <laughs> asking any questions and and the next question is how did you approach explaining the diagnosis to your child and after other family members but and then at one one day he kind of came to me and said why have I, have I to drink all these pills? What, what is this that I need to drink every day? And then I thought, oh my goodness, we never talked about, you know, the diagnosis. Or, I mean, he's just trusting me, he's taking these pills. Um, yeah. And I said to him, you're taking this for ADHD. And he said, oh, is that what it is? No, and then he started naming all the people in his class who also have ADHD. <laughs> so, 
that was quite interesting. So, um, and then I, but you can, sometimes you forget that you mm. did not, did not talk to them about it, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. How did and you it's, experience it? I suppose it's a very age appropriate discussion. Mm. So in the beginning, when they're younger, mm. it was always a fight to get that medication in. Mm. And I would battle with myself every morning and I would pray and I would cry and I it was really for me a personal journey and a, and a huge battle in the beginning because um, I felt like oh, I'm fighting you to get this medication in you. I'm not ready for it myself, but I can see the difference it makes for you. And it, it really was every morning was a, was a constant fight with myself because of the fight. And then eventually he just started taking it without question. And then, of course, the preteen came and he started to ask me, why must I take this? Um, and what actually happened was we went to the doctor and the doctor then turned to him and said okay well how's it going do you think you need more and that's actually what, where this conversation sparked because i dug my head in the ground and <laughs> so that sparked the conversation and then we actually had a very open conversation and where it was able to talk about adhd and just like your son my son was very keen to explain to me exactly who has it and who's on the spectrum and what they do that makes it different and what he does that makes him different and um and it was actually such a blessing because now we talk about how you are amazing and how everyone has their own sparkle and their own amazing way um i have two of them so <laughs> it it's it's a zoo in my house but um but it's fun and it's and it's we're just open, you know, and, and extremely different children. I mean, the one child, I can go to the shop with a shopping list, he'll hang, hang on to the shopping list and dare I go near something that's not on that list. And oh boy. And the other one is meanwhile charging up and down with the trolley and we can't put anything in the trolley because it's just running everywhere. So those are my two extremes. Um, and it's always interesting to to see that and to celebrate it. But it's not an easy journey. And the medication talk is one that is very age appropriate. I think for the younger children, you know, the safest thing is these are your vitamins. They keep us going. They keep they support us just like our vitamins support our bodies to stay healthy. This supports your brain to stay healthy. And when they're ready to understand um, that, or even when they start, because there will come a time when they start saying to you, but I think differently. I feel differently. I remember Lucha used to say to me, I don't feel feelings the way other people feel feelings. I, I don't feel as excited as other people. I don't feel as sad as other people. And then that started opening up the conversation. And, and I think that is what really helps. So your child will start talking to you when they're ready. I don't know how you found it, Johan, but I found... Yeah. Lucha and Enzo both, they started the conversations. Actually, they were braver than me. <laughs> the, the thing is, you, you, I promised myself I will answer every question as honestly as I can. Age appropriate, but I will answer the questions and I will explain it in the most easiest way that I can for, for, for that age. And I think that worked well once I discovered I did not, dis did not discuss it with him. But so we, after that, I tried to be as honest as possible. And, and I also went that route of let's, let's look at your superpowers, you know, yeah. um, because you can, you can focus on one thing more than other children can do. So I, I remind him every day about his superpowers and not focusing on the things that he can't do. Like he, he can't sit still or he can't do this. He can't, I tell him what he can do. And um, I reinforce that so that we can build this self-esteem. Because for me, um, having this diagnosis, it should actually, you should embrace it and it should not have an impact on your self-esteem. So the way that we talk about it is that we do not steer away from it. We talk mm -hmm. about it. It's part of our everyday life and we we manage it. And yeah. it, it's a thing like we need to tell them, tell me when your engine is in the red. Tell me when the, the noise is overwhelming. Um, and then, yeah, and remind me that we need to think about noise levels wherever we go, because sometimes I just forget. 
um, and I think you will enjoy it. And then we get there and I did not bring his noise cancelling earphones and then it's a nightmare for him. So, but now we're at the stage becoming a teenager to, for him to take responsibility for that as well. Yeah. I can't take all the responsibility for him. He must start taking because that's the aim. They need to take responsibility for this and, and to let it work for them. Um, it must work for them because it is a superpower. So, yeah, it, 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 I think it's a mind shift that we need to make towards that, to not see it as something that we need to cure, mm -hmm. but something that can enhance your life. It might exclude other things from your life, but it brings other elements into your life that you might not have had if you had, did not have this diagnosis. Yes, very much so. Um, I think for many parents, the whole idea of sporty child that you thought you were going to have or the the yeah. um, language strong child, it, it's something that you need to mm. actually mourn and, and realize what, what you've got and then found, find the superpowers. Definitely. So, yeah. so Sam, how did you manage your your emotional response and ensuring that your well-being, especially having two children, uh, especially in the early stages of the diagnosis? Because I think if you're the biological parent, in my case, I'm not the biological parent. So um, it's a little bit different because there's nothing that I could do, you know, so I, did, I don't have that guilty phase that many parents are going through. But but it's your biological children. So how did mm -hmm. you manage it? <laughs> I cried, I cried, and I cried some more. Um, I remember for my oldest one, um, I had to make the decision whether to go with medication or not. And he was in grade R, and he was this fabulous child, but he was climbing the, literally, oh, they would phone me and say, oh, he's on top of the roof, you've got to come get him down, or he won't come out of the kitchen, he's will only willing to sweep the floor, and he won't come to class, and, oh, you know, it was... <laughs> It really was. I mean, he even went missing once. So, oh. you know, it, it was a huge challenge. And it, so then to make the decision, and I was on a, a workshop, at a workshop, actually one of Melanie de Yaga's workshops in the southern suburbs the one Saturday morning. And obviously in her workshops it comes up and, oh, my word. And there was a discussion, and I think God just had me in the right place at the right time. And all the way from the southern suburbs to deep behind the Burrible's curtain, I cried. I drove and I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. Um, but after that, once I had had that good cry and that good argument with myself and with everyone involved, I eventually, um, I dealt with it. Mm -hmm. But yes, you do feel a lot of guilt. You do kind of, you know, what could I have done differently? Should I have started earlier? Should I have done more floor time as a baby? Should I have? <laughs> um, and that's actually why I was keen for our guest to join us today. Um, because her son, and, and unfortunately due to technical issues, but she is on and she is on Q&A, so she'll add her to her comments there. But um, I think it was, it is very difficult to accept that it is your child and it's part of you. But you know what they say, Johan, your child mirrors you. So <laughs> it was actually a learning curve for everybody in the family. And we had to have those conversations about, well, this comes from somewhere. And, and what was lovely, once he started on medication and he was managing better in the social environment, was for my husband and I to sit down and talk about it and actually go, you know what? <clears throat> If I had had this support mm -hmm. when I was younger, maybe my life would have been different. Mm -hmm. So it brings that, you know, it brings that that self-reflection and that understanding, which you wouldn't have if you didn't walk the journey. It helps you to understand a few crazy things you did in your youth <laughs> that you now have a better understanding for. In my case, it was also interesting. Uh, Dr. Melody Diacher is a very good friend of mine. Yes. And we had lots of conversations about it. And at one point, she told me, remember, this is not your diagnosis. It's his diagnosis. So don't take it all on you because then you can't support. It's mm -hmm. his diagnosis. Let's work with him. Um, and, and then let's work with you to be the best parent. So that was a that was a big mind shift for me to realize that there's nothing that I did wrong. I can just do the right things now. 
Um, and you're not going to be always perfect and right. Even as therapists, we know that we we kind of make a lot of blunders and we make a lot. Oh, of yes. Mistakes. But at least we can. There's a very interesting uh, comment in the um, Q&A section, Sam. So someone said, our biggest issue is to help the sibling to understand her ASD brother's diagnosis. Yeah, so that's Olga. Um, it's challenging for siblings to understand each other at the best of times. <laughs> but if you have one neurotypical and one neurodiverse, you always feel like the neurodiverse child is getting more attention. And it's tricky because you also sometimes expect more from the neurotypical child. And without realizing, you end up having a situation where the neurotypical child is expected to handle things where that the um, neurodiverse child is not. And it's difficult to get a balance in life, to understand each other. And, and how do you explain it? I mean, what do you say? I did a, a very interesting um, group work activity, a couple of school holidays in the Durbanville Library, where I did some group therapy with neurotypical siblings. Um, they all had ASD or ADHD, a very various um, neurodiverse siblings, and it was just a space where they could get together and chat, and um, we did some activities together and hold space for them. And the biggest frustration was that they struggled with how come they always got into trouble and their neurodiverse sibling did not. And it's very, very true because we do without realizing, we actually give a little bit more to the one and not to the other. So here's another comment, like mm. it's usually not just one conversation, it's an mm. ongoing open discussion as kids grow and the circumstances change. Mm. So primary school we're going to high school now so that we know we're going in a total <laughs> new phase it's got new challenges new structures new everything so it's different for every stage it is and when going back to siblings that conversation needs to be open and constant all the time as well what is the changes that everyone's going through and and I don't think it's it's something every situation will impact differently every single situation so tonight it's the popcorn and the one got more popcorn than the other. And why is that? But tomorrow something else will come up. And again, you have to explain the differences and why it's okay for one, not the other, or for one to handle it other than the, than the other. So it's, oh, you know, you can never put your hat down. <laughs> so how did you manage people in shops looking at your child who's throwing a tantrum? <laughs> how did you manage that? Because <laughs> it's so bad when they do that. <laughs> You know, I was that mom that literally walked away from her child. Mm. I can't tell you the amount of times I've just dropped a trolley and run. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then these two children come squirming after me. I've never yet got to the car without them catching up. But everybody has their own strategy. Mm. And it's there's so many times when I've wanted to go up to other moms and dads and just say, it's okay, just mm. breathe. <laughs> It'll yeah. be all right because, yeah, people do look at you. They do judge. They comment. Yeah. But, my, you know, the worst for me, and it sounds terrible, when I'm standing in the in the line or I'm at the shop and someone goes, oh, they're so cute. Mm. They're just boys. Leave yeah. them alone. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Mommy, don't be too cross with them. You take them um, home. <laughs> uh, there's an interesting comment, Sam, with, uh, now we're saying we tried to explain it, although the brothers uh, got AD, uh, ASD, it mm. looks normal, but his shortcomings are shortcomings are invisible. Uh, so if he had a wheelchair, it would have been easier to, to accommodate the differences. And I think even like in the shop, if this person is in a wheelchair, people can see it. Yes. But in the shop, they can't see that this child's got ADHD or ASD or any of those. Yeah. Um, or PDA, which is really so, uh, oh, problematic, yeah. that demand, um, pathological demand avoidance. And mm. um, so people can't see it. So they see just a child. Um, they don't have your background or your your you know all the experience that you had with your child. So mm -hmm. when there's a meltdown and somebody's kind of kicking in and 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 trying to help, they make it worse, you know. And you don't know how to how to work with that. Um, yeah. So I know you are a, a fundi on parenting styles, but how did 
your parent style maybe changes or not change or not um, to support your child's unique needs better because it has an impact on your parenting mm. style especially the way that you grew up with your own exactly. parent parenting style mm. yeah um so i i grew up with a very traditional dominant parent style like or their word is law um and quickly realized that that wasn't going to work with my two because if i match their energy then the the situation just escalates. Mm. So I have to be I have to constantly be on the back foot and constantly be in a situation where I have to first control the situation, first de-escalate the situation, and then we can get into this is the boundary. We're not going to push the boundary. This is the reasoning, and so on and so on. But um, I think you quickly realize with with ASD children and PDA and even ADHD, any child that struggles with emotional regulation, sensory, all of that, matching their energy level, shouting, then I shout louder, then you shout louder, it's not going to work. It's not going to work for you and it's not going to work for them. And we're not saying do gentle parent and have to explain yourself. That's not what we're saying. It's talking about that moment. You know that moment. You That moment when the toy hits the floor or the door slams, or the first screech comes, or the there, right there, where you just want to shout, get out of yourself, <laughs> shut up now. Um, right there, where you now as the adult have to take a deep breath and step back and de-escalate the situation before any boundaries can be put in place. It's that thing of, of choosing your battles for me mm -hmm. and to wait it out, because I'm somebody who will respond immediately, but I need it and I've had to learn when to respond and when not to um, because sometimes you have to wait it out so that you can connect a little bit later and then you will it will have an effect to to act in this moment at the same way as you said to it will just escalate it so to, mm -hmm. to, to wait it out was quite a challenge for me um, yeah so it was quite it was quite it, uh, it was quite a challenge for me here's another comment we sometimes felt that they, like we wanted to dress the ASD kid in a T-shirt that mentioned his diagnosis to avoid judgment and the wrong interpretation of the social or public situations. Yeah, I mean, that's sometimes we just want people to know. It's like when you have a, a, like a, a high-functioning autism child who, who doesn't like social interaction and then you, mm. they go to a party and there's always this person who feel they must, they, they feel they must play with the other children, but your child yes. is not enjoying that that will kind of lead to a tantrum they love the party if they're not part of it they just want <laughs> to observe the party and there's always yeah. someone who will then come and force them to take part and then that's where the the whole um social breakdown will come so it's it's also difficult because not everybody know how to uh, know how to 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 work with these children and, mm. and, and how to accommodate them so and then you you get so scared that you never leave the party <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you don't do drop you and go. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't do drop and go. You become this helicopter parent who's kind of there all the time because you just don't want. And I mean, there comes a point where you just leave when they say to you, oh, it was perfect. It was wonderful. Yes. <laughs> then you think they're lying to you. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. There's only particular people that you will do drop and go parties with because they have an yeah. understanding. Yeah. It's, uh, but it's, it, it is true. And to... Um, it's very difficult to get to that place, mm. but yeah, yeah, I, came, I came to a realization um, to... this yes. year where my son, he's now 13, mm. and he's got to navigate the world, and he's got to navigate high school, and he's determined to navigate traditional high school, and that gave me, I realized then, you know what, I have to let him go, I've got to let him do the drop and goes. I've got to let him go do play dates without me. I've got to try and just, I mean, he went to Tiger Valley for the first time with a friend this year. And um, <laughs> I was a couple of meters behind. Don't you worry. I was oh, like okay. super, the helicopter super was spy, there. <laughs> super spy Sam mode. <laughs> but the point is that um, you it's terrifying for the parents of a neurodiverse child. And no other parent will understand that. But they have to be empowered to deal with that. So I have to give him the words to say, I'm okay just watching everybody. I want to sit here and watch everybody for a bit. Um, and it's difficult to give them that. 
you know, but that's our role. And I think um, parents that are joined us tonight that have ASD children, it is a terrifying thought to let them go. Because I know what you like, Johan, if you could be at school with your son, you would be. But unfortunately, you at can't. some point they've got to go. It's like my nightmare of housing and afford his medication. That's another one. <laughs> but Sam, will we ever be ready? That? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just because you have such a close connection with your with your neurodivergent child. It's mm. you've kind of been so involved with this child. So a lot of your life is around this child and, and so um, part of it. It's it's very difficult. So what are the most significant challenges that you had to face in supporting your child, especially when we look at like assessment accommodations and um, you know concessions, all those things, um, things that you need to need to happen at school, like sensory breaks and all those things. What are your challenges there? Um, in the beginning, if we go back to the younger children, I think my biggest challenge there was to get the the school on board. Um, in his early grades, and also in preschool, um, mm. to get the the OT and the therapy at school so they could actually support with social skills right there and then, that they could actually help with um, social intervention and empower the teachers to assist my child with it. Um, I think that was a very big thing in the beginning. And then as we started more formal schooling, <clears throat> it was just to have teacher's comfortable with, if he needs to sit under the table, let him sit under the table. Um, if he needs to withdraw himself, let him withdraw himself. Mm. And I think with for teachers to be comfortable with that mm. was a very big, and, and to this day, it's still, it's still a struggle. Luckily, they, where he is now, he, they, they know him well, and they know when he needs to have, stay in and that kind of thing. But it wasn't an easy journey. And I think um, communication is very, very important communicating with your teachers and letting them know that it's okay to be comfortable with him not engaging with friends. You know, you get those messages to say, I'm very concerned, he's not really participating at break time, he's not. And then for you to be brave enough to say, you know what, it's okay. For the teacher to know that you're okay with it and they don't have to push it, that aspect. What did you find was difficult for, for you? Me, I had a very interesting challenge. For me, it was not the school, the teachers, um, or the academics, or any of that. Um, we had wonderful teachers. So from every year, we had an angel looking after us. But it was the other parents. Um, mm. And it was parents with also having neurodivergent children who did not want to accommodate mine. So, I mean, they went as far to tell me this child should not be in the school and they had meetings about that. Um, so it was my biggest challenge came from other parents and their children not mm. understanding, especially before we had a diagnosis. Mm. When, we had it, when the, we got the diagnosis, it became a little bit easier. But before that, um, it, that was my biggest challenge for people to have uh, an understanding that it's not only about my child, but it's about other children and, you know, all those things and to make, give them grace to to be at the school um, because they have challenges at school, especially in the beginning, and they did not want to accommodate that. Um, there's a comment here for us. Our biggest challenge were to re-educate the teachers at the start of every new school year. Mm. That is a big thing as well, because you start with a new teacher and every teacher approaches this in a different way. Exactly. It has been an issue, um, I know, for, for Olga and her family to to start and then to get that same message at the beginning of every year. Can we have a meeting about your son, please? I'm noticing da-da-da-da-da. And then you think, well, you know, he's in the same school. How come you don't know what, <laughs> what you're getting, you know? Um, and I've experienced it myself as well. And I'm sure you have along the way as well, Johan. And I think it's just to to be patient and have grace and to know that in this situation and, and being a parent of a neurodivergent child, you will always be a teacher. You will always be pushing that yeah. that word, even when even in situations where you shouldn't need to, unfortunately you will. So yeah, when your child is in mainstream education, you must always remember that not all teachers are 
interested or equipped or have a special interest in in working with neurodivergent children um as some teachers prefer to be a high school teacher some prefer to be in ecd or uh, foundation phase they don't want to teach um intermediate phase so you get teachers who really are not um it's and you can't blame them for it you can't it's just they don't have an interest in that um and then it's good to have a good conversation about that and try to educate them. But that is a big challenge if you have a teacher who do not understand um, your child's diagnosis. And then it, it takes a lot of extra time from you to to educate that teacher. But also to have grace for that, um, to be to to understand that. Um, but yeah. most of the times you get teachers who really would like if they if you empower them with the knowledge. I've seldom had that where a teacher did not have the patience to work with it, especially when you communicate with them openly, honestly, um, and say, this is what it is. This is how I deal with it at home. Can mm. you do the same in class? What do you do in class? I will do that at home. If you get that mm. relationship going so that there's, so that it's synchronized and that it's, there's a collaboration between you and the school, then oh, it's best for the child if you get that. Definitely best for the child. I'm always that parent that makes the appointment early in the year already. Mm. And I'm sure it says on my child's profile, look out for team <laughs> for parent meetings in, in term one. <laughs> I'm convinced they've written it down there somewhere. But it's yeah. okay. Yeah. You me, know, they, um, for me, they meet in the in groups. They don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> they meet me in groups. <laughs> we we'll be on their own. <laughs> yeah, not on their, on their own. Um, so that's, Sam, you know, it's good yeah. because it means that you are looking out for your for your child. Yeah, let's talk about um, <laughs> accommodations. Um, so what did you do? Because I know in my case, ADHD and with a little bit of dysgraphia and all that, there are so many accommodations and it's, but sometimes teachers tell you your child, they don't do it. So mm -hmm. what do you do? What do you need to know? So I think firstly, you need to, you need to have a conversation about it because <clears throat> sometimes you feel like your child needs the accommodations and sometimes teachers miss it because the child is so academically strong. And then it's extremely frustrating because you as a parent see it at home, you're struggling with writing, struggling with reading, um, and it makes it really, really challenging. But to have the conversation is a starting point and then to get your, your message across is important. So the idea that you need the support, that your child needs the support, and then to investigate ways to get the support and for it to be an actually, you know, given to your child and how can you go about it? So accommodations such as extra time and things like um, a, a scribe or a reader, all of those things contribute but I must say with that, it's also challenging to know when to provide the accommodation because often they do really academically well mm. until late intermediate phase where the amount of interpretation and the type of work really changes. And then accommodations are not always going to help. Mm. So it is really important to, to know your child well enough and to understand collaboratively with the teacher what very specific areas they can be accommodated in and should be accommodated for their best interest. It's a very fine balance and each child is really different. So here's another one. A big worry for us is when our son, uh, 12 years old, enters puberty. He's emotionally still about nine, 10 years old, but not sure how we are going to navigate the teens with ASD kid who doesn't have a filter. <laughs> you're there now Johan what do you think yeah it's difficult because for me it's more about friendship because two years behind emotionally is all about making friends um, and the friends are not on the same level so you always have this thing I don't have friends I think for me that is it's also very it's a big challenge having friends and, and friendships and not being alone so that is for us the biggest challenge in in, in that case um, Sam, a last question. Um, how, um, what, would, what have you found to be the most effective ways to help your child build self-confidence and independence? I know you there and it's important for you. <laughs> yeah. Independence is very important for me. Um, for me, I think it's finding 
something that interests them, which is so difficult to do in today's age because it's just electronics. But um, I'm maybe I'm harsh or my expectations are too high, but I insist that my children have one sport. It doesn't have to be a team sport. I know we, we did team sport. It did not go well. Um, so we um, they have individual sport and then um, an instrument. So they have to either do an instrument or some sort of art and that, you know, something in that line or debating, something like that. So we've never steered away from trying out activities, trying things like we have a rule they have to do it for a term, but I think it it really, really assists your child if you can find something that interests them, you know, that they want to do and that they can achieve, which doesn't mean competing with other people. So things like karate and jiu-jitsu are awesome because they don't compete, compete against others, they compete against themselves. Um, scouts, my one son absolutely loves scouts because the rigidity and the rules about it um, helps him a lot. And the other side of it is he doesn't have to struggle to fit in because he is part of a patrol and no matter what, every week is part of the same patrol and they are a team regardless of whatever happens. And that I find helps a lot. There's none of this, you know, we avoid situations where it's going to be Joey chooses his team and Sally chooses her team because mine will be the last chosen always. <laughs> so we avoid um, that kind of activity. And then really for us, when it comes to self-esteem, is finding something that they can, not achieve, it doesn't have to be great achievements, but just the, the ability to go, hey, well done, you really sparkled in that today. Or well, that was better than yesterday. Just looking for those opportunities. Those that was better than yesterday opportunities. Really build self-esteem. And then supporting academics where necessary so that they can feel capable. I think for me that is a very big, a big part of it. If we need to, if I sit till two o'clock in the morning writing out tests for them to practice tomorrow, just so they feel a little bit more capable, um, that makes a big difference for them. There's a comment here, fully agree mm. with you, Sam, something unique that sets them apart, like an instrument, sport, hobby, that's quite important. And then yeah. there's a last question here, which I think you need to put on your Etsy hat now, um, and that is, is ADHD curable? And also, does the child need to be on medication for life? We get that often. Yeah. So no, it's not curable. It is a part of your your profile, just like you are friendly or shy or caring or loving or um, hyperactive or not hyperactive or attention deficit or um, oversensory stimulated. It, it's all part of your profile and who you are. There's nothing wrong with it. We're all different. Um, I think now that we have these labels, we try to hide behind the labels, but it's no different to what it was before. What's important is to to normalize it and to remember that regardless of a label, you are still a unique person and you still have strengths. No, medication does not have to be for life. Um, the reason why we use medication throughout their school career, or at least the intermediate phase, foundation phase, intermediate phase, is to help the brain to be alert enough to take in learning. As the brain develops through adolescence, it then sort of, we call it pruning itself, it, it loses what's unnecessary, keeps what is necessary. And after the phase of adolescence, so when we reach about grade 10, 11, you'll find that your child will start only taking medication or being very aware of when they need the medication and not. Mm -hmm. um, I have many high school learners that will say, you know what, I, I don't want to take long acting, I only need it to help me until first break because um, that's when I have maths and languages. But my other practical subjects, I can handle without it. So they get to know themselves. And then their understanding of the use of the medication, the impact of the medication really helps. Now, I've got students who are at tertiary level that will only use short acting when they have um, lectures. And then they will use long acting when they have study sessions. So it really is then becomes part of I mean, my, my um, partner is also 
attention deficit and he also only takes it when he has a long huge quote to do then he'll take it <laughs> so it really does become part of a management tool for life further on but when in schooling and with the younger learner we really do motivate that it's consistent so that they can remain alert enough to take in learning and incidental learning which is what many of our attention deficit children miss out on mm -hmm. Yeah, there are also a lot of different ways that you can treat adult ADHD. It's quite a new field um, because adult ADHD is, is kind of been a field not for very long, um, but they have a lot of other options on how to treat it and it, different options work for different people. So mm -hmm. and that's a field on its own. There's a um, last question just because some people from Kiro Aitzif are here. They ask, why do we not offer sports at Kiro Aitzif? Um, because it's so good for them. We do offer it, but we offer it in conjunction with K um, Kiro Durbanville Primary just because Kiro Aitzif doesn't have the, the the schoolyard to and they have yeah. to have the, at the sports fields because there's just no space there so <laughs> it's they do it in conjunction with Kiro primary school in Durbanville yes. and so our the, team sports mm -hmm. our team sports are with Kiro Durbanville in at the primary school and the high school we have learners there too yeah. mm -hmm. um but on campus at the primary school we do offer jiu-jitsu for our foundation intermediate phase children mm -hmm. um and we do that in the school hall so they enjoy that and then our foundation phase children do have the um, rugged roots and yes. netball and that kind of thing. Yes. Um, so it is there mm -hmm. and the jiu-jitsu is a recent addition. So that is something for our older children to enjoy. Wonderful. Yeah. And the coaches at the two schools are really amazing. So it's good for them to go and join there. Thames, thank you so much. It was lovely talking to you. And thanks for everyone joining us tonight. Um, I hope you have. Uh, Okay, got something out of the conversation. To be the parent of a neurodivergent child is a challenge, but it's also have its joys, as you all know, and it's a journey. I know people hate the word journey, but it is a journey. <laughs> it <laughs> and, is a journey. And it, it's a very special journey. Thank yeah. you, Sam. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice thank evening. You. Good evening. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you to Olga Jardine, who was going to join us today. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, technically, it didn't happen, but yeah. she did post in the Q&A, and we're yeah. grateful for that. So thank you, Olga, and your family. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Johan. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.